podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation Presents Management of Eyelid Paralysis with Dr. Guy Mousery. I'm Lisa McKinley, director of our foundation, and I'm being assisted today by our Portland, Oregon support group leader, Barbara Pasternacki. Our presentation today will last approximately 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from our attendees. You may type your questions in at any time in the questions box on the control panel on the right side of your screen, and Dr. Masri will answer them as time allows. Now I would like to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Guy Masri is a board certified oculoplastic surgeon who specializes in eyelid paralysis surgery and treatment. He also trains other physicians, lectures nationally and internationally, and has published several textbooks and peer-reviewed articles on ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery. He currently practices in Beverly Hills, California. Welcome, Dr. Masri. We're happy to have you today. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here too, and I'm honored to speak and that people would wake up at odd hours abroad and hear um, in the United States and give their Saturday way to hear me speak. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the management of eyelid paralysis. I am an ophthalmic plastic surger, surgeon, that's a, an ophthalmologist who then did plastic surgery and specializes in cosmetic and reconstructive work around the eyelids. Um, uh, eyelid paralysis has been an area of uh, interest to me for years and I've um, been very involved in the field and we've come up with some innovative techniques on how to correct these problems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about today. I think for me, the most important thing is that physicians that do this really have to understand the needs of the patient. So more than just before and afters and what can be done, I'm going to talk about a modality of, uh, of, uh, of understanding the problem that exists and find the best ways to treat it. I do practice in Beverly Hills. I am a, a professor at the University of Southern California um, and we do train physicians, fellows, and um, for uh, transparency, I do receive royalties from Elsevier and Springer, which are publishing companies that have published a series of my textbooks. So let's get started. And as you all know, um, this problem of facial eyelid paralysis is a big problem because it's a life altering issue. And what I mean by that is it causes physical, emotional, functional problems. And most importantly, it affects confidence and self-esteem it affects how a person feels about themselves and how other people view an individual. And I think unless you've actually suffered from this problem, there's really no way to understand it, or unless you treat people with this problem routinely, it's very hard to understand it. And I really recommend that anyone that has this issue doesn't just see a specialist in ophthalmic plastics, but someone that really does this work. Because at the end of the day, the interaction of the patient, the bedside manner, are just as important as the skills. This is probably one of my favorite slides. And it's what I'm really saying is that you really have to uh, see caretakers who understand the problem and that a good doctor comforts always, you know, and reassures and it's much more important than what they do with medicine or surgery. Now what's most important to the patient is that the physician is present and understands and listens and is their advocate, and then thinking out of the box. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on thinking out of the box because our current treatment modalities surgically in many ways are archaic. And I think that very little effort has been put into improving this over the last 30 years. And over the last four or five years, myself and some colleagues have worked very hard on developing new techniques to help this problem. Now, what's important uh, to the doctor really is educating the patient. The top uh, on this slide, it says happiness equals reality minus expectations. That's critical because the delta, the difference between reality and expectations is the outcome. So there is a reality and you can see it's a jagged line because life is full of bumps and turns. Then there's expectations what someone wants and it's a straight line because all a patient wants is a good result. But if the expectations are set too high given the problem, there can never be happiness because reality is fixed. So having realistic expectations is a goal, improve comfort, symmetry, a better appearance, we'll show you all this. And it's important to know that the eyelids are very different than the face, because in the face you can take nerves from, that are innervating other muscles of the face and redirect them to the paralyzed muscle. But 
as of yet, we can't do that to the eyelids in a consistent way. So the most important thing on the eyelid is to preserve the muscle that closes the eye, which is the orbicularis muscle, and most of the surgeries we do incise the muscle, but we need to do surgeries to protect the muscle. So what is it that really defines the outcome of the procedure? Well, it's what I call corneal protective mechanism. How do we protect the surface of our eye? Well, the first is that we're able to close the eyes. The muscle that closes the eye is called the protractor. It's the orbicularis muscle. There's also a muscle that elevates the eye called the levator muscle and an accessory one called the uterus muscle. The, close, the muscle that closes and the muscles that open work with each other in consort. It's like the bicep and tricep of the arm. If you weaken your tricep, your arm will, 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 um, will contract. If you weaken your um, uh, biceps, it will contract in the other direction. Same thing with the eyelids. If you weaken the muscle that closes and the eyelid will open, when the eyelid opens, it's exposed. Um, so eyelid closure is critical and protecting that muscle is critical. A Bell's or Dahl's eye response is when one closes their eyes, the eye rolls up underneath the lid. If the Bell's response is poor, then it's more difficult to correct the problem. In this patient, you can see that the Bell's response is good. Tear production, we'll talk about you have to make tears and corneal sensation or feeling on the surface of your eyes important too. So this patient over here, you can see, doesn't have a Bell's response. When we go back here, you can see that you can't, when the patient's closing his eye, you can't see the cornea. But on this one, you can because the eye is not rolling up. This would be a much harder person to correct their problem. Tear production is tested by putting a filter strip in the eye and seeing how much tears are being made. And we use this. And in general, cosmetic eyelid surgery may not be so critical, but on someone who's got a dry eye or can't close their eyes, tears are critical. It's a test that we do. And finally, corneal sensation. If I were to take a cotton tip and touch anyone's eye who's never had pathology, they would kind of jump out of their chair. Their eyes are very sensitive. But on someone who's had um, seventh nerve, seventh cranial nerve disease, sometimes the fifth nerve is involved. And sometimes for other reasons, sensation isn't as good and it's very hard to make them better too. So my rule, one, two, three, and four, is that less protective mechanisms, more difficult to provide comfort. So you have to check those mechanisms and I actually have developed an algorithm based on my findings with these mechanisms to find out how much better I can make someone and how much more comfortable. This has nothing to do with appearance, just function and comfort. What are the common problems we see? Painful eyes, dry eyes, like this red eye over here is a dry eye, that's what it looks like, blur of vision, inability to close the eyes, tearing eyes, and discharge. So what are conservative solutions? And this is really important that anyone with this condition has because I spent more time talking about this than anything else. Lubricating the eyes, drops during the day, ointment at night, preservative free are the best, the preservatives can be toxic to the eyes. A humidifier in the bedroom is incredibly important, especially during the summer in areas that are dry and not as humid because when you moisturize the air, people are much more comfortable. Uh, moisture chamber goggles like you see in the picture over here, they kind of adhere to your skin, you create a, a moisture chamber, that helps. Simple things you can do at home, although not comfortable, is to put Vaseline around the eye and put Saran Wrap on it to create the moisture chamber. Taking the eyes at night obviously is not fun. Contact lenses. And then what I really want to bring up that many don't know about is what's called a PROS lens, P-R-O-S-E, prosthetic replacement of the ocular surface ecosystem. Funny name, huh? Well, an ecosystem is like any ecosystem, whether it be in a desert or a forest, it's the, sur the ecosystem of the surface of the eye. And you can see, um, um, I'm pointing to, the, to this arrow here, this is this big lens that covers the cornea, the surface of the eye, and also the white part, the sclera, and tears build up underneath. And you take the surface of the eye that's painful and abraded from dryness and protect it. There's a number of centers in the country. There's one here in Los Angeles, one in Boston, one in Michigan, and others that make these lenses. They were approved in 1994 to protect the cornea for surface disorders. Bell's palsy or facial paralysis causes one of these, um, and it could be a lifesaver. I've seen this alter people's lives. So people that are having a lot of difficulty, you should consider the pros lens, and I can talk to people about it um, um, when, uh, should that become an issue. Tearing. Tearing is a very unique system, uh, symptom in this, and the tearing can occur for a variety of reasons. This arrow points to the tear duct, this little opening. So when the eyelid becomes paralyzed and falls off the eye, the tears don't get into the tear duct. And when they don't get in, they run down the face. It also blurs your vision. When tears pool up, it's like water pooling up in a bathtub. It can get murky and infected. 
And when it does that, you can get eye infections. Um, you can also get tearing because when the muscle doesn't work well and the eyelids don't contract, you can't pump the tears out. Draining tears is an active process. The eyelids must blink and push the fluid to the tear duct. Also, if the lid comes off the eye, that's called an atropion, and you can't capture tears. That can be corrected surgically, and you can have an obstructed tear duct. But the other reason that few people talk about is what's called aberrant regeneration um, or crocodile tears. And what that basically means is that um, if you look at the seventh nerve, the facial nerve, it has motor function or movement function. It also has function that's not for movement, but it's autonomic. It's a different part of the nervous system. It's things that we don't control. And as you can see here, this is the tip of the tongue. Part of the facial nerve, the autonomic portion, supplies the tip of the tongue, and part supplies the tear gland. This is one root, this is another. And when you have the facial nerve regenerate after trauma, the fibers that hit the tip of the tongue can go to the tear gland in error. They aberrantly regenerate. So when you eat and you taste, it causes you to tear. The way to treat that would be to inject Botox to the lacrimal gland because it turns off that root. So tearing may require Botox and it may require surgery, the evaluation is everything. And tearing is an incredibly difficult and annoying problem. What are the abnormal periocular findings? A droopy brow, an upper lid that's pulled up or retracted, inability to close the eyes, a lower lid that's flipped out, and droopiness of the cheek. Those are all surrounding the eye, so let's talk about them. So brow ptosis, as you can see here, is when the brow is fallen because the muscle that elevates at the frontalis has been paralyzed. So how do you correct brow ptosis? This is the most powerful means of correcting it. It's called a direct brow lift, where tissue above the brow is excised and it's sewed together. The lower lid, which was ectropic or falling away from the eye, was corrected here too. This is um, in the uh, one week to 10 day post-operative period with stitches in place, and this is in about a year out. So you can see the difference from here to here and from here to here in the brow and in the lower lid. So this is a direct brow lift. There is a scar. If you have bushy brows, it's usually camouflaged. We really reserve this for men with thicker brows, although you can also do it in women um, as long as you can hide the scar, but the scar is not that noticeable compared to what we have here. So that's a direct brow lift. The incisions above the brow is very powerful, very predictable. And you can see, even in aesthetic patients, there are people that I do aesthetic surgery on who other means of brow lifting can't help them, and they have what's called a direct brow. So if you look before and after, before and after at the eyelids and the brow, they look essentially better, and you can't tell there's any scars. That's a direct brow lift. That's method number one. In 2011, I, I described a large series of patients, a new procedure called an external brow pexy. A brow pexy is when you adhere the brow to the deeper bone tissue. And this is a woman who had heretic brow, um, not from bells, but from another reason. And she'd had surgery, you could see the scar. But I, I won't go into the procedure because it's too time consuming, but by lifting this brow with a brow pexy and giving Botox above the brow on the side, you can give her symmetry and kind of maintain the symmetry. So that's another way to do it. This is another way to do it. The endoscope is a lighted telescope that goes under the skin and it allows you to lift tissue of the face, such as the brow, and you do it through a minimally invasive approach without any scarring. And you can see this is a patient of mine who, a wonderful patient of mine who unfortunately had seventh of disease. And this was my picture preoperative. Look at the brow up here and the brow down here. And this was the picture she, she sent me preoperatively. Brow up here, brow down here. She lives far away, so she sent me a postoperative photos and look at the symmetry of the brows. And also beforehand, you can see that the lower eyelid was very asymmetric and more symmetric now too. We'll talk about lower eyelid surgery too. But this is the endo style brow lift that doesn't leave any scars. Another example of a paretic brow on the left side. And after lifting the brow and doing some work to the eyelids, before to after, look at the symmetry. Now these are more subtle changes compared to more severe disease that you can see the symmetry. And another example over here, the very asymmetric brows and in the post-operative period, the more symmetric brows, again, without leaving an external scar. She also had some facial surgery by my associate, Dr. Zizere, and she's just in the healing phase. 
fit. This is a this is a video. Sorry about the sound, and it's going to show how you secure a brow. I thought it would be of interest. Let's run that again. Sorry if it's a little loud. It sounds loud. So that's the scarless way of doing the incision. It's behind the hairline. I just wanted to show you so you would see it. Let's talk about the upper lid now and lowering it or recessing it. For years, um, let's start here. With the face, when there's paralysis, you can take nearby nerves and transfer them to the weakened muscles to get function. You can't do that in the eyelid. To close the eyelid better, you can't re innervate it as of yet. So we use lid loads or weights, and you can use a gold weight, a platinum weight. You can use, instead of a solid weight, a chain, and you can also use filler like wrestling as a lid load. And I think there's a question about that, and I'll answer it. And traditional weights were put low in the eyelid, but I found that they were very visible. But the lower they are, the better closure you get. And this is what a typical gold weight looks like. You can get allergy to it, less so the platinum. Um, and besides weights, you can just cut the muscle that lifts the lid. That's called the blepharotomy. I talked about filler. My evolution was to put this initially pre-tarsal low in the lid, but I didn't like that because it looked very bulky. So I started putting it much higher in the lid and I added another innovation I'll show you. So this is the cartilage of the lid, the tarsus. Here's the weight. This is the muscle that elevates the eyelid. And you can see that the weight is placed a little bit higher. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to hide the weight because I don't want uh, things like this where you get a bulky eyelid from the weight being exposed. So that's why I started putting it in different locations. And what I did was I put it lower and I took the fat of the eyelid and covered it because when you cover it with the fat flat, it hides it and it's not so obvious which makes a very, very big difference. So this fat flap of publishing the results in a large series of patients now, no one else in the country really does it. And what it does is it um, protects the visibility of the weight. Um, uh, and it's a pretty standard uh, technique. And these fat flaps have been used, these are publications for many reasons in eyelid and aesthetic surgery things that I've published and some of my associates, but never for this procedure before. And I think it's a big step forward in hiding these weights. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, what about the lower lid? This is a paper that I published a number of years ago with some colleagues called the Minimally Invasive Orbicular Sparing Lower Eyelid Recession. What do I mean by that? Minimally invasive means doesn't require many cuts. It spares the orbicularis, the muscle that closes the eye, and it elevates the lower lid. This is a landmark in my opinion, one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done in my 20 years of work, because this has changed people's lives in so many ways. It, it raises the lower lid, it tightens the lid without making any cuts in the muscle of the lid, and it equalizes the opening of the eyes. That's a lot to do at one time. A lot of this was hard work. A lot of it, I think, was luck. Um, I've been, been very successful and really happy with it. In the surgical series, basically, and I show these so that people have an understanding because they always ask me, you know, what happens during surgery? This is from inside the eyelid, the muscle that pulls the lid down is being released, and then the corner is being elevated, but no cuts in the corner. It's all done through the upper lid. So the muscle of the lower lid is not involved. Just another photograph of how that's being done. Another photograph. And then the outer corner of the eye is made shorter with something called a uh, uh, tarsorophy, which I'll show you, but this procedure where you take apart the other outer part of the lid. So if you look here, the cut is in the upper lid crease. The corner has been non-violated. The lower lid is non-violated. This is still what the majority of people in the country do. Take apart the whole corner of the eye. 
And when you cut that and take it apart and put it back together on an eye that already has paralysis, you weaken the muscle more. Again, compare it to here where the corner is untouched. Very, very big difference, results are better. And then a procedure just to make the um, opening of the eyes more equal. So just to show you, immediately before and after surgery, obviously the eye is smaller immediately afterwards, and the eye is smaller immediately afterwards. That's just an immediate result. If you look at people a little longer out, this woman had the lower lid elevated. You can see the white is showing here. It looks so oblong. Here, no white is showing. She'd refused a gold weight, or it could have been even more symmetric. You can see all the white is showing here. Um, and in this next patient underneath, the white is not showing because the lid has been lifted. You can barely tell there was surgery. The muscle has not been violated. Honestly, not much can be told. And that's what this new procedure has done. So a really wonderful patient of mine who's been a big advocate who had this appearance from a paralyzed face, just the eyelid part. The eyes twice the size of this eye. All the white is showing. She had all the symptoms of exposure. This was her picture she sent me before. Again, she's from a distance, so she sent me pictures. And this is her picture afterwards. So her picture before, her afterwards, look at the symmetry. And this is what she looks like on the two eyes. I don't believe anyone can tell me that this eye ever had paralysis and look how symmetric it looks, no evidence of surgery, no evidence of scarring. So I'm really proud of this innovation and this procedure and I have a lot of great colleagues working with me and we now use it routinely. And I do this quite often and people come from all over the country and all over the world for this because again, this is a, dis dis a dis uh, disabling disease. Another example of how you could make the eye symmetric, if you look at the size of this eye and this eye before surgery, look at the difference. And this is after surgery, pretty close. I showed you this before. Her brows were equalized, and so was the eyelid opening with this, what we call MEOS, or minimally invasive orbicular sparing surgery. No gold weight was placed here. And oftentimes when you do this, the lower lip comes up, so you don't need a gold weight in the upper lip. As I said, I can put the weight in and cover it with fat so it's not noticeable, but you can spare that procedure. Another example of this, a very severe eyelid problem before and afterwards, still can't close the eye, but look at the improvement in lower position and look at the improvement in eyelid closure. So while not perfect, certainly much better. Another example, this is bilateral eyelid paralysis, what's called facial diaplegia, before and after. You can't even tell surgery was done, look at the difference. This gentleman has not had the brow addressed yet. He separated the eyelid from the brow, but look at his lid, look afterwards. The brow has to be addressed. But again, minimally invasive, you can't even tell surgery was done. And those are the key to surgery. Minimally invasive, can't tell anything was done, quick recovery, symmetry, good aesthetics, good function. I wanted to bring this up because it's important. When you have eyelid paralysis, the eyelid muscle encircles the eye like a sphincter, like any sphincter. And when it becomes weak, the eye becomes widened this way and becomes bigger this way. So you have to lower the lid, and you have to improve it this way too. And that's by re-securing the corner. And if you do that alone, don't do anything else, the closure of the eyelid or its biomechanics become better. There's been a lot of studies to show that if you appropriately tighten the lid, its closure becomes better if that's all you do. And this is an example of a, a, a great person who I've um, been taking care of for a while. Look at how red this eye is. There's a red band here, it's because it doesn't close. And after doing that, after surgery, she ended up looking like this. But look at the closure and the exposure here, and now her eye closes. It's just simply by tightening the lid and making the symmetry of the fissures more equal. Minimally invasive, life-changing from her. This red eye is barely red anymore. Those are big deals, because when you're all day tearing, all day have a painful red eye, very difficult to find. This is a tarsorophy, or when you secure the upper and lower lid laterally, it shortens the fissure, the opening of the eye this way, but it's a much better procedure to do than, again, to cut up the eye when you do all these other things. And it can be done in an aesthetic way when you can't tell that it was done. A lower fascial sling. You also have the option of putting a piece of tissue from the body or a suture or foreign piece of tissue from the middle to the outer part of the lid and tightening it to support the lid. It acts as a hammock. This is a drawing from one of my papers. It acts as a hammock to support the lid. I'm not the biggest fan of this procedure. And the reason is, I think that this gives with time and needs to be redone. 
I have done it and I will do it as a last resort when necessary, but I look at this more as something temporary. When I say temporary, it may last four or five years. I don't think it has lasting effect. I don't think it's an answer. I think it's, again, the belt and suspender slinging the eyelid up. Um, and, and so if we don't have any options, we use it. But I think as we think out of the box, um, we will find better solutions than we have, and I'll show you some of those. This is a palpebral spring. This is a spring. It springs open, and it's, it's, it's put in the upper lid under the brow between the lid, and when it springs open, like the opposite of a safety pin, it pushes the lid down. Um, this has been used for years and years and years. To be honest with you, I've taken so many of these out, and I rarely put them in because I think the complication rate is high. If it works for you, it's golden. If it doesn't, it's an ongoing issue with problems. And this does really involve, the, uh, the surgery involves the muscles of the upper lid and cutting into them. And again, I prefer not to do that. It makes no sense to me to cut into muscles that are already weak. I'll repeat that. It makes no sense to cut into muscles that are already weak, yet it's being done routinely all over the world. I'm having a tough time really understanding why that's still the modality, why no one's thinking at another level. Skin grafting. Sometimes people's disease is so severe that when the lids flip down, the skin contracts, and now you're short on skin. I wrote a paper on skin grafting injection of a wound modulator, anti-scarring medication called fluorouracil. And what we found was that these patients don't have paralysis, but as examples, this is a lid that's pulled down, this is a lid that's pulled down with a skin graft in it. The skin graft doesn't look good at first, but look at them at nine months. The lid looks normal and you can't tell anything. Um, whether that would have healed on its own anyways, or the 5FP made a big difference is a tough one to tell you, but I use this a lot with skin grafts and I find that patients do very well, and even on women it's not noticeable. This is a skin graft early on in a patient with uh, facial paralysis, so it's still red in about a month, but these heal very, very nicely. And I think that skin grafts may do better in patients with eyelid paralysis because when the muscle doesn't contract, the graft doesn't scar or contract as much too. So 5-FU um, injections after skin grafting and also Botox, which inhibits the muscle fibers from contracting, may also play a role in improvement of scarring. So skin grafts, I think, do better in paralysis and should be thought of in patients that are having persistent problems. Palate grafts, another graft that we use. This is tissue from the roof of the mouth. When the lid is pulled down and you want to elevate the lid, you need something to stent it up or to push it up and support it. And this tissue from the roof of the mouth is called a composite graft, made up of many layers. It has fat, it has a, like, a connective tissue, cartilage type substance, and a lining tissue. And the lining of the roof of the mouth if you use it in the eyelid, eventually becomes like the lining of the eyelid. And some people use foreign materials from cadavers. I don't because I think it induces more inflammation. And if it was me, I'd only want my own tissue. This also tends not to shrink. It's a specialized procedure that people in my field do. You do have to know what you're doing. The roof of the mouth heals quickly, but we use this in eyelid paralysis all the time. And anyone who's having surgery here always questions, well, what are you doing in my mouth? Well, this is what we do. I have a little short video I'll show you on it. Tremendous procedure, very consistent. And this is kind of what we do here.
So um, I'm not sure if the sound came through there. Basically, look at this pull down lower lid and look afterwards. The graft was used to elevate it. The graft begins from the roof of the mouth. It becomes thinned out, cut specifically with shape. It's very artistic, placed in specific layers of the eyelid. And again, this is done from the inside of the eyelid so you don't violate external tissue, skin, and muscle. Um, it doesn't really lead to much scarring. It's called, it's used for lower lid retraction repair. It's a lower lid spacer. Its thickness also gives volume, and the volume probably supports the lid too. Very useful procedure. You need someone very skilled in this to do it, very common in this problem. This is another um, tissue graft that we can use. This is fat. Fat grafting is used to inflate depleted tissues. Um, in, this, in this example, I used filler instead of fat, so it can be done immediately in the office. But look how hollowed out this is. And look what happens after filler but, filler. but look what happened to the lower lid. This gentleman has facial paralysis. You can see the lower lid is flipped out. He has all the symptoms we talked about. Um, and so what by um, inflating the lower lid, the lid came up. The lid turned in. This is immediately afterwards, and this is about a month afterwards. Look at the improvement. Now, filler and fat, if you inject it in the lid, could lead to lumps and bumps and problems, but if you know how to inject it, you can avoid those. Um, in paralyzed eyes, I told you that um, skin grafting probably works better because the there's no contraction, it doesn't scar as much. Fat may actually lead to more lumps and bumps in paralyzed eyes because there's lack of movement of the face. It doesn't break down the fat. We don't know that, but that's something we're looking at and studying now. Um, it's excellent for the middle face to support the lower lid, and it corrects what's called the vector. The eye is here, the cheek is here, so the eye is working up against a gradient. And if you see the area, arrow, it shows it's working against a gradient. But when you bring the cheek out, it's like putting an implant in, and now the gradient response, the lid position is better. So, so fat works very, very well in the situation. Now I'm going to talk to you about something you've heard about from no one, and this is the future. And this is what excites me about medicine, always thinking about the future, because I think the future is everything, and I think we get stuck in the present, and I think a lot of what we do really is archaic. And so myself and some colleagues have worked very hard on figuring out better ways to do things. So let's look at this. This is the orbit. This is the bone that in encases the eye, the eye muscles, the fat of the eye, etc. We have focused on operating on the eyelids, and I get it. I understand why. But if you think about it, when an eyelid becomes paralyzed and can't close, what would happen if you set the eye back, set it back, what I call orbital surgical vector correction? By vector, as I showed you on this previous slide, the eye looks prominent. It's ahead of the cheek. And now the cheek is out. So this is what's called a negative vector, and this is a neutral vector, that the cheek is now in line with the eye. And when the vector is neutral, the lid comes up, and the eye will now get better closure. If you set the eye back, the paralyzed eyelids don't have to work so hard to get over the arc of the eye. Think about that. You have paralyzed eyelids. We can't give them more muscle. All we can do is pull and tug on them, which weakens them even further surgically. What if we set the eye back? This is done for patients that have Graves' disease, the most common autoimmune disease in the United States. It's a thyroid issue where the eyes kind of bug out. Our former first lady, Barbara Bush, who just passed away, great woman, had Graves' disease and had surgery for it to set the eyes back. So in, in eyelid paralysis about two, three years ago, I thought, why not drill down the bones, set the eye back so the eyes close better? This reduces the prominence of the globe. And when it reduces the prominence of the globe, the eyelids should be able, even though they have less muscle, to less function to their muscle to function better. And you can do it in scarless fashion by making hidden incisions inside the eyelids. And it's just an amazing concept. So we've been using this, and we've had incredible success. Interestingly, when I look at patients before and after that have had eyelid paralysis with the surgery, sometimes when they close their eyes, it doesn't look like they close better. But they universally tell you their symptoms are better, which means that the windshield wiper function of the lid must be functioning better because the eye is set back and the muscle that's already weakened doesn't have to work as hard. So some examples. This is an example of someone who can't close their eyes. This is after surgery, setting the eye back. They can close their eyes because the 
they can't close their eyes because the muscle is weak. Also, the eye is prominent. By setting the eye back, it's not prominent, and the muscles that are weak don't have to work as hard because the eyes are set back. And this young woman had many, many eyelid surgeries, not paralysis, but as a point of reference, she can't close her eyes because the muscle that closes the eye, just like in uh, Bell's palsy and other forms of facial paralysis and eyelid paralysis, the muscles become weak. Now we've set the eyes back. The opening is a little smaller, but she can close her eyes and function. So it's a real important concept. It's a new way of thinking. And at this year's um, society meeting that we're having, I'm chairing a session on eyelid paralysis, and we're going to talk about orbital decompression, decompressing the orbit in patients with paralysis. And what we found is for every two to three millimeters, of reduction in eye prominence, that's the medical term for it, the lower lid comes up a millimeter. So you can raise the lower lid, lower lid is higher here, without touching the eyelid. Think about that. Raise the lower lid without cutting on an eyelid. If you don't have to cut on an eyelid that's already weakened, think of the benefits. Look at this example of a woman, couldn't close her eyes, all the white is showing under her eyes, she had multiple surgeries, Look what happened when we set her eyes back and we set the eyelids. All of a sudden, she can get coverage and close her eyes. She could function again without symptoms. And that's what I'm most proud of because patients with this condition can't function. Because it's very hard to go out into the world and be tearing all the time, have a red eye, be light sensitive. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So this is thinking out of the box. The minimally invasive lower lid elevation I showed you is thinking out of the box. Taking fat and covering a weight, an implant, a gold weight, which looks obtrusive, is thinking out of the box. And that's what's needed in this field. And I think the current generation of young physicians getting into the field are now thinking out of the box and are training with people that are guiding them in that direction. And that's a big positive sign for the future. So we're making progress. So I think in conclusion, the important things are to think about protecting the muscle that closes the eye. Don't think about cutting this muscle, protect it. Think about improving the mechanics of eyelid closure. And most importantly, in essence, think out of the box because the future is no longer in the belt and, spent and suspenders pulling on the lid, yanking on the lid, thinking it'll make it better. When you have weak, paralyzed eyelids, you can pull on them all you want. They're still paralyzed. Make them function better. And the only way to make them function better is to change their environment, set the eye back, avoid cutting on a weakened muscle, um, or re innervate them. And we're not at the point where we're re innervating yet, but hopefully back in the future. So I appreciate your attention on this Saturday and allowing me to speak. And this is my information. I can be reached any time on these phone numbers or through my website. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Masri. That was a great presentation. My um, honor. Wonderful. Um, I do have a few questions. You might have answered a few of these, but let me just go through. And um, okay, first is from Elizabeth from Australia. And actually, she says hi to you. She met you in Australia two years ago. So she's excited to hear you today. Um, yeah. She has a question about Botox. Um, I'll combine her two questions. Um, she gets Botox around her eye, but she had heard that you shouldn't get it under the eye, but she has synchronesis. And yeah. then also her surgeon said that Botox can weaken the eye muscle. So what is your opinion on that? Right. So a few words, um, Botox or botulinum toxin, um, as we know, is a toxin that can infect food. And if we get it systemically, it's obviously lethal. But when given by injection, it's given at such low doses that it can't really harm us systemically. And it is a muscle weakening agent. I didn't mention synkinesis. Let me say a few words. Synkinesis, when I talked about the aberrant regeneration of the taste, the tongue to the tear gland, and that's why when you taste, you tear. Well, when the, when the branches of the facial nerve re a branch that goes to the mouth can go to the eyelid. So every time you move your, your mouth, talk, pucker, kiss, eat, your eyelid contracts. Upper and lower lid, the eyelid becomes smaller. That's called synchronesis. So in that situation, someone has increased tone. The tone of the eyelid is strong. That actually protects them when they have facial paralysis. 
but sometimes it's a little too much. And routinely, to give Botox under the eyelid to someone who doesn't have synkinesis, you've got to be very careful because the eyelid can droop. But when you have synkinesis, there's so much increased tone. In the hands of a very experienced injector, it's pretty safe and can open up the aperture and make it look asymmetric to the other side. I have at least 100 patients in my practice on an ongoing basis that have this problem, and I've rarely seen issues with injecting under the eyelids if it's done in a safe way by someone who's experienced. Okay, great. Um, I have another question. This is from Louise. Um, mm -hmm. She says her surgeon, she already has one eye weight in, but her surgeon currently is suggesting to put in another weight on top of the one that's already there. Have you ever heard of this? What are your thoughts on this? So I've never put double weights in. I would wonder what the size of the weight is because they come in different weights. They can come in 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1.6 grams. And the weight functions by how much weight it's displacing on the lid. So maybe uh, it, it may be the largest weight there is, um, but if it's not, maybe just exchanging for a larger weight. Um, I think if the largest weight isn't closing the eye, then adding more bulk to the lid, in my opinion, probably doesn't make a lot of sense because I think the disfigurement and problems from not one but two large foreign objects in your eyelid um, probably may be more significant of an issue um, than would be the eyelid closure. I'd be very careful putting two weights in an eyelid. That would be, it is thinking a little out of the box, but it can also lead to a lot of problems. Okay, great. Um, some more questions about eye weights. Um, this is from Rachel. I'll combine her two questions again. Um, she's had previous eye weights that she's had to have removed due to complications. Um, do you think she would be able to try again to have another weight, uh, or do you think she's going to have complications? And then also for her, is there have you heard of some type of a gel eye weight that people yeah. are using now? So. Um it depends on the reason you had the complications. If you were allergic to the material, you would have to switch the material. If it was uh, um, moving in the eyelid, migrating, or if it was extruding, popping through the muscle and skin, those are more significant complications. It would really depend on the examination, looking at the old op reports and getting a good history. But I've seen people that have failed weights and then been successful later. It could just be uh, the, sur the surgery that was performed too. Um, the gel weights are filler. You've all heard of fillers for facial wrinkles and hollows. Those fillers have names like Juvederm, Restylane, Belotero, Perlane, which has a different name now, Restylane Lift. Um, those gels have weight to them. So rather than putting a piece of uh, a weight made out of gold or platinum, you can flip the eyelid and from the inside inject into the correct plane this gel and you can put more or less, you can titrate the amount you have to act as a lid load or a weight to help close the eye. We do that quite routinely, pretty successful with it. And it's a non-surgical way of putting a weight in. But it does have to be repeated because that material will be dissipated or will go away over time as the body breaks it down. But that's a very realistic thing to do. Okay, um, wonderful. Um, I think that's... Our main questions at this point, um, let me look here. Okay. See if I've got anything else. But, okay, I think we'll conclude our presentation here. Our webinar recording will also be available for viewing on our website within a few days at www.facialparalysisfoundation.org. And you can also find out more about our upcoming webinars, support groups, and online meetings through our Facebook and website and also Instagram. We want to thank you, Dr. Masri, for your presentation today. And thanks to all of those who attended today's webinar. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to share my experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Have a wonderful day. Okay, great.